Yeah, yeah, amen. Well, let's stand together and sing hymn number 687, He is Coming Again. Lift up your heads, pilgrims are weary, see days approach, now crimson the sky, night shadows flee, and your beloved, awaited with longing, at last draweth nigh, he is coming again, he is coming again. The very same Jesus, rejected of man, He is coming again, He is coming again, With power and great glory, He is coming again. Dark was the night, sin warred against us, Heavy the load of sorrow we bore. But now we see signs of his coming. Our hearts glow within us. Joy's cup runneth o'er. He is coming again. He is coming again. The very same Jesus rejected of man. He is coming again, He is coming again, with power and great glory, He is coming again. Oh, blessed hope, oh, blissful promise, filling our hearts with rapture divine, oh, day of days. Hail thine appearing, thy transcendent glory forever shall shine. He is coming again, he is coming again. The very same Jesus rejected of men. He is coming again, he is coming again. With power and great glory. He is coming again. Even so come, precious Lord Jesus, creation waits, redemption to see. God up in clouds, soon we shall meet thee, O blessed assurance, forever with thee. He is coming again. He is coming again, the very same Jesus, rejected of man. He is coming again, He is coming again, with power and great glory. He is coming again. Amen. Our text this afternoon is John's Gospel, chapter 8, and verses 38 to 47. John 8, 38 to 47. I speak the things which I have seen with my Father. Therefore, you also do the things which you have heard from your Father. They answered and said to him, Abraham is our father. Jesus said to them, If you are Abraham's children, do the deeds of Abraham. But as it is, you're seeking to kill me, a man who has told you the truth, which I heard from God. This Abraham did not do. You are doing the deeds of your father. And they said to him, We were not born of fornication. We have one father, God. Jesus said, for I have not even come on, or I'm sorry, Jesus said to them, If God were your father, you would love me, for I proceeded forth and have come from God. For I have, have not even come on my own initiative, 
but he sent me. Why do you not understand what I am saying? It is because you cannot hear my word. You are of your father the devil, and you want to do the desires of your father. He was a murderer from the beginning and does not stand in the truth because there is no truth in him. Whenever he speaks, he speaks from his own nature, for he is a liar and the father of lies. But because I speak the truth, you do not believe me. Which one of you convicts me of sin? If I speak the truth, why do you not believe me? He who is of God hears the words of God. For this reason, you do not hear them, because you are not of God. This is the word of the Lord. You may be seated. <clears throat> well, we enter again today into the disputation between Jesus and members of the crowd gathered at the temple during the Feast of Tabernacles. As we learned the last time we were together, this particular group which Jesus was addressing believed him when he made certain statements, but they did not believe in him like others in the crowd did. Um, Jesus told these people, the way to attain true freedom from their slavery to sin. But they did not listen to him. He said, if you continue in my word, then you are truly disciples of mine, and you will know the truth, and the truth will make you free. They answered, and they said to him, we are Abraham's descendants, and we have never been enslaved to anyone. How is it that you say we will become free. See, they couldn't understand that the nature of their slavery was actually far worse than any kind of slavery to Pharaoh or even chattel slavery like we had in the uh, last century or two um, in our country. The kind of slavery that they were under was far worse and it was to a far more evil master, for their slavery was to the devil and to sin. And the only way for these people and for us to attain freedom from that slavery is to continue in Christ's word, to learn the truth about him through the word and to believe in him. Now, I just have to say, as a recap to what I said last week, that that's the reason why attending church and listening to the preaching of the word is so crucially important. It is so crucially important. It's the reason why the Lord says, do not neglect the assembly of the saints. He says that to the Hebrews. Don't neglect the assembly of the saints. Why? Because faith comes through hearing and hearing through the word of Christ. And it is in the assembly of the saints where we typically hear preaching, where we have brothers and sisters to exhort us in the word, to correct us where we've gone wrong, even to rebuke us if necessary. It's why gathering together is so essential. It is, it is the essential church. <laughs> Just like that movie that came out. Church is essential. It's more essential than any of the kinds of precautions that at least were first taking place when that pandemic happened, right? Church is more essential. And it was clearly the plan of the evil one to shut down the church during that time. And so many, we could see then that so many churches simply complied. It oh, doesn't matter. We don't need to meet together anymore. We can just stay at home. Why not meet together and live together and, if necessary, die together? Really? So, Jesus says that to them, that the way to attain true freedom from slavery is to continue in Christ's word, to learn the truth about him through it, to believe in him. The answer was so simple. Just believe in Christ who is the personification of truth. He alone holds the keys to freedom. But instead, these stubborn rebels put their 
hope and trust in something else. They put their hope and their trust in their heritage, in their bloodline. Because we are the physical descendants of Abraham, that's all we need. We are the physical circumcision. That's what they were claiming. And they trusted and hoped in that heritage over and against the Messiah. They thought that their father was God and that they were the children of Abraham. But Jesus was about to show them otherwise. Look at verses 38 to 39. <clears throat> Jesus says, I speak the things which I have seen with my father. Therefore, you also do the things which you heard from your father. They answered and said to him, Abraham is our father. Jesus said to them, if you are Abraham's children, do the deeds of Abraham. See, in the ancient Near East, and particularly within the language of the Bible, this imagery of sonship, sonship or the children of someone um, was defining of one's character. I'm going to show you some examples of that, how one's sonship is defining of one's character. The term son or children in the Bible has different meanings depending on the context. In the Greek, that language can refer to physical offspring or to a distant descendant or to someone who shares the same nature as their father. In the New Testament, son is used metaphorically in many cases to describe believers who share the same nature as God the Father through faith in Jesus Christ. That, that is that they become the children of God. And thus the children of God have certain characteristics because they are the children of God. They walk in the light as he is in the light. They love one another. They, uh, 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 you know, carry out the commands of Christ because they are a part of the family of Christ. They're the children of God. And conversely, being called sons of or children of some evil characteristic means that that person bears that characteristic. In 1 Samuel 2.12... It says, now the sons of Eli were sons of Belial. They knew not the Lord. That word Belial means worthlessness. So Samuel wrote that the sons of Eli were sons of worthlessness. It meant that they themselves were, well, what we would call worthless characters. They we're doing evil. That's why they were called sons of Belial. In Mark 3.17, Jesus gives a new name to his disciples, James and John. He calls them Boanerges. What does that mean? Sons of thunder. He calls them the sons of thunder. Why did he name them the sons of thunder? It's because that described their character. Sons of thunder. It was James and John who wanted to call down fire from heaven on a Samaritan village that rejected Jesus in Luke 9.54. Surely, they were sons of thunder. In Genesis 35.18, when Rachel was dying in childbirth, with her last breath, she named her baby Ben-Oni. Ben-Oni means son of my sorrow. Son of my sorrow. The baby's father, however, called him Benjamin, which means son of my right hand. Why did he do that? Because he understood the significance of being called a son of something, a characteristic, right? If this boy grows up and he's the son of my sorrow, everybody would have looked at him. Oh, the son of sorrow. He did not want that for his boy. He calls him Benjamin, son of my right hand. Because he understood the implication of his son being called Ben-Oni. People would think that it was his fault that his mother died. So to save the boy from that, he changed his name, son of my right hand. So then, Jesus tells them, I speak the things which I have seen of my father, therefore you also do the things you have heard from your father. Who is their father? They answered and said to him, Abraham is our father. What they meant by that 
was that what Abraham was, they themselves were as well. Abraham is our father. We are the sons of Abraham. We are the daughters of Abraham. And Jesus replies, if you are Abraham's children, then do the deeds of Abraham. But as it is, you're seeking to kill me. A man who's told you the truth, which I heard from God. This Abraham did not do. Now, in other words, if you want to call yourselves the sons of Abraham, you must bear that out in your actions. Abraham did not attempt to kill the Messiah. Abraham did not reject the Lord. Abraham did not ignore the clear signs which God showed him. What deeds did Abraham do? Well, he was a man who loved the Lord. He was a man who obeyed the word of the Lord when God called him out of Ur and into the promised land. He heard and believed the Lord when the promise was issued that Abraham would have a son in his old age, even though that was a hard thing for Abraham to believe, just as it would be a hard thing for anyone to believe. Abraham receives this promise when he's already an old man, 75 years old. He had to wait another at least 25 more years till he's 100 years old. Why? Wow, you know, let me just say why do you have to wait that long? He's already old. When God gives him the promise, he's already old. Why does he have to wait so much longer, another quarter century, before the promise is fulfilled? So that God could show that his power is made perfect in weakness. That it's the Lord who did it. It's God who receives the glory for Isaac and nobody else. Nobody else. So he believes, even hope against hope, knowing that his body is as good as dead. He still believes. These are the deeds of Abraham. And Jesus says, if you want to call yourself the children of Abraham, do the deeds of Abraham. Believe in me as Abraham did. He heard and was obedient to the Lord who gave him the covenant of circumcision, which again, I think it was easier for Noah to receive his sign than it was for Abraham to receive his sign. <laughs> All right. For real. Oh, here's a rainbow. That's great. Don't have to cut the flesh off in order to receive the rainbow. Here, the sign of the Abrahamic covenant. Cutting off the flesh. And yet, this hard command from the Lord, he receives it. He does it. He believes in the Lord. And so he obeys the Lord. That's why. He honored and gave a tithe to Melchizedek, who was at the very least a type and shadow of the Messiah. He was obedient to the Lord when he was told to sacrifice his beloved son Isaac on the altar. Look at the deeds of Abraham. Actually, if you think about it, just the ones I've named here, this is a very short time I've been talking about this. Every single one of those were incredibly hard things that Abraham did in obedience to the Lord. In obedience, cuts off the flesh. In, in obedience, he leaves his father's household. I mean, in obedience, he, he uh, even puts his son on the altar. Jesus is saying to them, you want to call yourselves the children of him? Oh. In the kind of biblical imagery, if you're the sons of Abraham, then you must act as Abraham did. The true sons of Abraham do the deeds which result from faith in the God of Abraham. That is why in Luke 19, when the chief tax collector Zacchaeus climbs down from the sycamore tree, what does he do? He climbs down when Jesus says, I'm coming to your house today. He says to the Lord, oh, Lord, I'm going to give half of my possessions to the poor. And if I've cheated anyone out of anything, I will pay back four times the amount. And Jesus said of him, today, salvation has come to this man, for he, too, is a son of Abraham. Isn't that amazing? He becomes that 
through faith in Christ. He believes in Christ, which is why then, and believe this, Zacchaeus's faith preceded his action. His faith in Christ preceded him saying, I'm giving away half of my possessions, and if I've cheated anyone, I give it all away. Which, just think about this for a moment. What Zacchaeus was saying there was that he would bankrupt himself. Actually, half of my possessions plus how I got my fortune in the first place was cheating people. Paying back them four times the amount with only half of my possessions left means he's giving away everything, everything for Christ. He gave everything to Christ. And that was the result, not the cause, but the result of his faith. And those actions proved Zacchaeus' faith. In Christ. And Jesus says, You are a son of Abraham. Salvation has come to your house today. What Jesus didn't mean when he said that Zacchaeus was a son of Abraham was this He didn't mean that Zacchaeus is a Jew. That's not what he meant. Uh, Zacchaeus, you're a Jew. You're a direct descendant of Abraham. What it meant is that Zacchaeus had the faith of Abraham. It meant that he did the deeds of Abraham. Galatians 3.7 elaborates, Know then that it is those of faith who are the sons of Abraham. That's it. Those of faith are the sons of Abraham. Zacchaeus was a son of Abraham because he had faith in the same Lord that Abraham did. That made him a son. Look, Jesus says that the children of Abraham do the deeds of Abraham, but they were, these people were doing the opposite. Look at verses 40 to 43. As it stands, he said, you are seeking to kill me, a man who has told you the truth which I heard from God. This Abraham did not do. You are doing the deeds of your father. And they said to him, we are not born of fornication. We have one father, God. Jesus said to them, if God were your father, you would love me. For I proceeded forth and have come from God, for I have not even come on my own initiative, but he sent me. Why do you not understand what I'm saying? It is because you cannot hear my word. There's so much here. Look at the profundity of what Jesus tells them in verse 40. He tells them that they are seeking to kill him, but that Abraham did not do that. What? Abraham, do you know when he lived, Abraham? He lived 2,000 years before Christ spoke those words. Abraham lived as long before Christ spoke those words as we live after Christ spoke those words. So Abraham lived 4,000 years ago. All right. So then, what is Jesus talking about when he says that Abraham did not try to kill him? He didn't try to kill him. He tells them in 50, verse 58 of John 8, this chapter, he says, before Abraham was born, I am. Right? It's because Jesus precedes even Abraham who lived 2,000 years ago. Abraham actually met Jesus. He met Jesus in Genesis 18. If you keep your fingers here, turn back to Genesis 18. I'm going to read part of this to you now. Uh, Genesis 18, 1 to 8. Now the Lord appeared to him by the oaks of Mamre, while he, that's Abraham, was sitting at the tent door in the heat of the day. When he lifted up his eyes and looked... Behold, three men were standing opposite him. And when he saw them, he ran from the tent door to meet them. And he bowed himself to the earth. And he said, My Lord, if now I have found favor in your sight, please do not pass your servant by. Please let a little water be brought and wash your feet and rest yourselves under the tree. And I will bring you a piece of bread that you may refresh yourselves. After that, you may go on since you have visited your servant. And they said, 
so do as you have said. So Abraham hurried into the tent to Sarah, and he said, quickly, prepare three measures of fine flour. Knead it. Make bread cakes. <laughs> I just I read that. This is so amazing. It's so amazing. He doesn't even have bread ready. He tells his wife, make this bread really, really quick. Do you know why? Because the Lord is standing outside of our tent. Make three bread cakes. Abraham also ran. So look at verse 6. Abraham hurried to the tent. Verse 7. Abraham ran to the herd. And he took a tender and choice calf and gave it to the servant. And he hurried to prepare it. See that hurried, ran, hurried to prepare it. He took curds and milk and the calf which he prepared and placed it before them. And he was standing by them under the tree as they ate the Lord and two angels appear to Abraham. When, when, when Jesus says, you're trying to kill me, this Abraham did not do. What did Abraham do? Abraham ran to serve the Lord, not kill the Lord, serve the Lord. To, to quickly bring the best of his fatted calf. Prepare it for the Lord. Bring the water for his feet. What does Jesus say to the Pharisee in whose house he is? You brought me no water for your feet, for, for my feet. You have not anointed my head with oil. And here's this woman, this sinful woman comes, cries on his feet, wipes his feet with her hair, pours out the alabaster jar of perfume on him. She is a child of Abraham. This Pharisee who would call himself a child of Abraham was not that. Why? Because he did not do the deeds of Abraham. That's why. Look at this. Look at this. Look at verses 20 to 26. And the Lord said, this is him still in Genesis 18. Now he's talking to Abraham. And the Lord said, the outcry of Sodom and Gomorrah is indeed great and their sin is exceedingly grave. I will go down now and see if they have done entirely according to its outcry, which has come to me. If not, I will know. Well, who lives there in Sodom? Abraham's nephew, Lot. He lives there. He knows that the Lord is going to go there and pour out judgment on that place. He fears for his nephew. He loves his nephew. He says, <clears throat> look at verse 22. The, the men turned away from there and went towards Sodom while Abraham was still standing before the Lord. I mean, just picture this in your mind's eye for just a moment. There's three men there. Two angels, as we learn in the next chapter, two angels go to Sodom and grab Lot and drag him and his family out of that place. These angels depart. Abraham watches them walk away. Who is he standing with still? Jesus. This is a theophany, a pre-incarnate appearance of Jesus in Genesis 18. Here's Jesus standing with Abraham. The men turned away from there. They're going towards Sodom. Abraham's still standing before the Lord. Abraham came near and said, I came, let me just. Abraham came near. He came near to the theophany of Christ. And he says to Christ, will you indeed sweep away the righteous with the wicked? And of course, we, we know that Lot was a righteous man because the New Testament tells us that. We would not know that unless there was that declaration. He's saying, will you destroy it? Will you destroy the righteous as well? Suppose there are 50 righteous within the city. Will you indeed sweep it away and not spare the place for the sake of the 50 righteous who are in it? Far be it from you to do such a thing, to slay the righteous with the wicked, so that the righteous and the wicked are treated alike. Far be it from you. Shall not the judge of all the earth deal justly? Mm, here 
Abraham acknowledges that the person who is standing there under the trees of Mamre in front of Abraham's tent with him is the very judge of all the earth. The judge, the king of kings and lord of lords. It's Jesus. It's Jesus. Jesus says to him, for the sake of 50, I will not destroy it. And then he goes down the line for the sake of um, 30, 40, for the sake of 30, for the sake of 10. Look at verses 32 to 33. And he said, oh, may not the Lord, may the Lord not be angry. And I shall speak only this once. Lord, suppose 10 are found there. And he said, I will not destroy it on the count of the ten. As soon as he had finished speaking to Abraham, the Lord departed, and Abraham returned to his place. And then we know what happened in the very next chapter. We know <clears throat> there was not ten. That's what we know. There was not ten. And God rained down fire and sulfur on that place. Look at what do we see? Abraham bowed down to the Lord when he met him. He provided food for him and water for him. But one thing he didn't do, he didn't seek to kill him. Even when Jesus told him the very hard truth about his impending judgment that he is about to pour out on Sodom and Gomorrah, even then Abraham didn't call 318 fighting men Come and kill this man. No, no, he didn't call the guards to come and arrest Jesus. He submits himself even in the hard things, even in the hard things that the Lord says to him. He submits himself under them. Look at what Jesus says. As it is, you're seeking to kill me, a man who has told you the truth, which I heard from God. This Abraham did not do. It's the same Lord who's speaking to them, who spoke to him. Mm. He doesn't even complain when Sodom was destroyed. There's no record in the scripture of Abraham uh, crying out to God and complaining about God's judgment being poured out. So no, these people to whom Jesus um, these people whom Jesus are, uh, is addressing in John 8 are not the spiritual descendants of Abraham. Rather, in the following verses, Jesus explains exactly who their father is and who he is not. He first says, you are doing the deeds of your father. And they say to him, we are not born of fornication. We have one father, God. Jesus says, if God were your father, you would love me. For I proceeded forth and have come from God. And I have not even come on my own initiative, but he sent me. Notice how Jesus replies to these people who are claiming that God is their father. He gives them, and by extension us, the true test of whether or not a person is a child of God. A true child of God loves Jesus. That's it. If God were your father, you would love me. A true child of God loves Jesus. Therefore, if anyone does not love Jesus, they are not a child of God. The reason that this is the test is because Jesus is the image of the invisible God. It was the Father's good pleasure for all of the fullness to dwell in him and through him to reconcile all things to himself, having made peace through the blood of his cross. Through him, I say, whether things on earth or things in heaven, Colossians 1, 19 to 20. So that if a person rejects Jesus, if a person hates Jesus, then they also hate God the Father. Because God not only sent Jesus, but all of the fullness of divinity dwells in Jesus, and Jesus alone makes peace through his blood shed on the cross. Do you see that? Jesus makes peace through the cross. <clears throat> Why is that so necessary? It is because man is naturally at war with God. That's the reason why. Man is naturally at enmity with God. 
He's at war with God. And so to reject the one mediator between God and man is to reject peace with God and to remain in a state of war. Do you see? If you don't have Christ, if the blood of Christ is not covering if you, you, if you don't trust in Him, receive Him as your Lord and your Master and your Savior. If you don't receive Him, you are at war with God. And there is nothing, nothing that you can do to make that state that you are in any different. Nothing. That is a very terrifying place to be. At war with God. It is a fearful thing to fall into the hands of the living God. Hmm. This is what Isaiah was saying in Isaiah 40, 1-2a. Comfort, comfort my people, saith your God. I was listening to the Messiah the other day. I played it for um, my son. How they sing... Come for ye, right? And then speak ye comfortably to Jerusalem and cry unto her that her warfare is accomplished, that her iniquity is covered. Man's warfare against God and uh, God's warfare against sinful man is finished only through faith in Jesus who makes peace through his shed blood on the cross. But if you do not receive that, you remain in that state. To reject him is to reject that peace that he offers. To reject him is to reject the Father's great olive branch of reconciliation. To reject Jesus is to reject God altogether. What grave danger these people were in, therefore, who foolishly believed that they were at peace with God when they were not these people here in our text in John 8 are just like the false prophets of Jeremiah 6 to about whom Jeremiah says, listen, listen, they have healed the brokenness of my people superficially, saying, peace, peace, but there is no peace. Do you see that? They've healed the brokenness of my people superficially, saying, peace, peace, there is no peace. There is no peace and there is no sonship for anyone who does not believe in the Lord Jesus Christ. This is the clear teaching of Scripture. It's so clear, actually. It's so clear. Even the people of Jeremiah's day, who lived hundreds of years before Jesus walked the earth, even their problem was the same problem of people today, trying to solve this, trying to solve their warfare by some means other than the means which God has provided. You cannot do it. There is no other way. Jesus alone is the Prince of Peace. He's called the Prince of Peace because there is only peace in him. And that word peace, I think our culture, our zeitgeist, our modern spirit of the age doesn't even understand what that word even means, peace. They think that peace is a feeling. That peace is something that, uh, well, I, I feel copacetic. Peace. Peace, man. Right? What? There is no peace. There is no peace in that. When we say there's only peace in Jesus, we're not talking about a feeling of peace. Though, though there may be comfort and a feeling of peace for those who have truly trusted in Christ. Surely that may accompany true faith in Christ. But that's not ultimately what we're talking about when we say there's peace in Jesus. It doesn't mean like, oh, take a deep breath and I, I just have this peace about me. This calmness. Because you know what can cause that feeling? Uh, Hydrocodine. Uh, uh, that, that, can, that can cause a feeling of peace. It's a false peace. Do you know that? Heroin can cause a feeling of like, I'm just relaxed. I'm at peace. There's no peace. Peace means a cessation of warfare. 
that the war is over. Whether you feel it or not is immaterial, actually. Whether the Christian, and, and, and look, I'm not saying it's wrong for the Christian to have a sense, a feeling of peace. We, we uh, certainly may have that. But the feeling itself is immaterial. The fact or the lack of that fact is what really matters. Are you at peace with God or are you still at war with God? That's what ultimately matters. And there are multitudes, multitudes of people who are on the train to hell right now. And they're at peace as they're going there. They have peace inside. They've, uh, through either drugs or through wretched psychotherapy or through whatever other means they take to deceive themselves into thinking that they actually are at peace when they really are not. Hmm. Jesus says to these people who thought that very same thing about themselves, they thought because we're the children of Abraham by blood, not by faith, but by blood, because we're the children of God, because we're Jews, because we're Israelites, we're the children of God. To them, Jesus says, why don't you understand what I'm saying? Why don't you? It is because you cannot hear my word. They are the people to whom Isaiah says are ever seeing but never perceiving, ever hearing but never understanding. Otherwise, they might turn and be forgiven. They have eyes, but they're blind. They have ears, but they're deaf. Here is literally the Lord of glory standing in front of their very eyes, speaking the words of life to these hard-hearted fools, and they are deaf to him. What more could the Lord do for them? I mean, truly, what more could he do? He could not speak more clearly to these people. He's the greatest teacher in the history of teachers ever. Why? Because he only ever always speaks the truth. He never stumbles. He never speaks falsehood. He only speaks the truth. And actually, in a little bit, we're going to see that's the reason why they can't understand him is because they're so accustomed to the lie. They're so accustomed to lies that when Christ comes, who only speaks the truth, when he speaks the truth, it sounds like a lie to them because they're so accustomed to lies. Do you see that? How ironic that is? How ridiculous that is? Satan has so twisted their minds. I'm getting ahead of myself. They have eyes, but they're blind. What greater evidence could Christ give? He speaks the truth, but the people refuse to listen. And the reason why they refuse to listen is because of what Jesus says in the next verses. They are of their true father, who is the devil. That's why. Verses 44 to 47. He says, you are of your father, the devil, and you want to do the desires of your father. He was a murderer from the beginning and does not stand in the truth because there is no truth in him. Whenever he speaks a lie, he speaks from his own nature, for he is a liar and he is the father of lies. Let me just pause and say this. That necessarily means that there is no such thing as a white lie. That's a oxymoron. It is... A contradiction of terms. Every lie is black as sin, crimson stain upon our souls. Every lie, every lie. He's the father of lies. All lies generate through him. And Jesus goes on, but because I speak the truth, you do not believe me. Which one of you convicts me of sin? If I speak the truth, why do you not believe me? He who is of God hears the words of God. For this reason you do not hear them, because you are not of God. Plainer words could not be spoken. They are not politically correct words, right? They're not easy to understand. Jesus could never be accused of tickling people's ears. That's for sure, all right? No, no, no. He tells them the truth. 
Here we see the plain fact of the matter. It was not because these people's unbelief, and this is so important, this is so crucial for us to grasp, it's so crucial. Unbelief was not because something traumatic happened to them. Like there was this person who recently published some article that said, oh, the reason why Richard Dawkins is an atheist is because his mom and dad weren't there for him as a child. No, no, that's not what Jesus says. What does Jesus say? Uh, Richard Dawkins doesn't believe because he's a child of the devil. That's the reason why. Because he's lost in sin. Because he's turned away from God. That's the reason why. It's not because something bad happened to him. It's not because they didn't hear the truth. It's not because they didn't see the Lord. They're literally looking at the Lord in the flesh. It's not because they were dumb. It's not because they didn't have enough evidence. It's not because uh, they weren't smart enough. It's for one reason only. Because they were of their father, the devil. That's the reason. That's the reason Jesus gives. Because they were of their father, the devil. He says, the reason you do not believe is because you're a child of the devil. Have you ever <laughs> heard anyone ever say that to anyone ever? <laughs> I mean, really, in, in, in your and my evangelism, as we are speaking the truth to unbelievers, uh, <laughs> have you ever told an unbeliever the reason that you don't believe is because you're a child of the devil and you need to repent? You need to repent of your unbelief. You need to stop suppressing the truth in unrighteousness. You need to ask the Lord for his grace to adopt you into his family through faith in Jesus Christ. That's, that's what needs to happen, right? That's the plain, the plain fact of the matter. That's it. That's it. I mean, as I read Christ, the master say, he's the master. He's the one who's saying it. It's not David Lovey saying this. He's the one who's saying it in the text. He says this to them. This is the cause. This is the reason. I don't know. Maybe, maybe, you know, that is actually a more needed message than this one. Friend, did you know that God loves you and has a wonderful plan for your life? Like, maybe this is actually the more biblical way to speak to unbelievers. In love, not saying, you're a child of the devil. No, be why? Why? Because I also was at one time. I was. Right? And I'm like, you, and I'm better than you. That's not what I'm saying. What I'm saying is this. We were all lost and dead in sin. We all were. And that if a person doesn't believe in Christ, this is the reason. It's because they suppress the truth in unrighteousness. Because the devil has control over them. And even it's a willing control. The prince of the power of the air, the spirit that is now at work in the sons of disobedience. Do you notice that? Sons of what? Remember, remember, remember when we talk about sons? It means the characteristic. The spirit that is now at work in the sons of disobedience. That disobedience then is actually the characteristic of the unbeliever. It's an unbel The unbeliever is the unbeliever because he doesn't obey. That's why. Not because he doesn't know. Because he doesn't obey. That's the fundamental problem. It's a lack of obedience. Obedience to what? Obedience to Christ's command to repent and believe. I mean, ultimately, it comes down to that. The sons of the devil, he says, they, they want to do the devil's desires. They want to murder because he is a murderer from the beginning. What does that mean? A murderer from the beginning. Mm, Revelation 20 tells us, I think it's Revelation 20 verse 2, tells us the dragon, that ancient serpent, uh, who's the ancient serpent? The one in Genesis 3 who said to Eve, Did God really say you shall not eat of every tree in the garden? Did he really say that? Huh. God's trying to keep you down, isn't he? He's trying to withhold something from you. 
Oh, God said we shouldn't eat of it and we shouldn't touch it. For in the day that we do so, we will surely die, Eve says. The serpent says, you will not surely die. For the Lord knows that in the day you eat of it, you will be like him, knowing good and evil. He tempted her to leave her station and become like God. This is the original sin, pride. It's the original sin. It's the very sin which Isaiah 14 and Ezekiel 28 both say Satan himself committed. That he saw his own beauty. He was corrupted by his own beauty. God made Satan, Lucifer, so beautiful that as he looked upon himself, he said of himself, I will exalt my throne above the heavens. I did, I'm the one who deserves to be worshipped. Look how beautiful I am. I, wa I want to be like God. And he's cast down from heaven. Jesus says, I saw Satan fall like lightning from heaven. So Satan falls like lightning from heaven. And then after that happens, goes to use the very same temptation with which he himself conceived of, which caused him to be cast out of heaven. And he applies that temptation to mankind. And man fell for it. Our father, Adam, fell for it. And the Eve. That's what Jesus is saying when he says that Satan, the devil, is a murderer from the beginning. It's because he knew that what God said was true. In the day that they eat of it, they would surely die. That's exactly what the devil wanted. He's our adversary. He wants us to die. He hates us. That's why it's so foolish and dumb for people to, you know, mess around with witchcraft and devil worship. And, you know, nowadays even young people think that it's cool to do that. We have a real adversary who wants to destroy us. We'll mess around with that. He's a murderer. He desired to murder Adam and Eve and all of their progeny. Sin desired to have Cain in Genesis 4, who then murdered Abel. The devil is a murderer. That is why these people wanted to murder Jesus, because they were doing their father's desire. The prince of the power of the air, the spirit is now at work in the sons of disobedience. They were not the sons of Abraham. They were the sons of disobedience and the sons of the devil. And not only were they the sons of the devil and murderers like their father, but liars as well. He was a murderer from the beginning and does not stand in the truth because there is no truth in him. Whenever he speaks a lie, he speaks from his own nature, for he is a liar and the father of lies. But because I speak the truth, you don't believe me. There's so much that we can say about this. I think I'm going to actually save this verse to expound on it more next week, just to talk about that, that the true nature of spiritual warfare has so much more to do with a war for the truth than a war over, like, territory, how spiritual warfare is portrayed as, like, Satan is over this town, or Satan is, is over this community. And, no, no, Satan is a liar. That's ultimately where our warfare needs to take place, is to preach the truth in opposition to the lie, right? To preach the truth to the culture, to preach the gospel of Jesus Christ. That's how we do warfare. That's how we fight, as we preach this word. We trust this word because it's the truth. We preach this word. We pray for people to come to a knowledge of this word, the word of God. But suffice it to say, these people were so accustomed to believing lies and speaking lies that when they hear the truth, it sounds like a lie to them. That's why Jesus says, because I speak the truth, you don't believe me. How insane that is of them. Crazy. What a backwards reality we live in. 
that lies are accepted and the truth is rejected. And it's not just these people. It is all people outside of the knowledge of Christ who is the light of the world. To those who are outside of that light, the truth sounds like a lie. Because they're so accustomed to lies. And it takes the supernatural work of the Holy Spirit of God to open anyone's eyes to see the truth of these things. It takes this supernatural work. Man outside of the Holy Spirit's work is easy prey for the devil, like shooting fish in a barrel. It's easy prey for him. He doesn't even hardly have to try. Uh, because we're already naturally at the gravest disadvantage since we are born in sin. We already have an inclination away from God and towards sin. Since we already have that inclination away from God, it's not as though uh, we can even blame Satan for our condition. We are naturally slaves to Satan, but we cannot blame Satan for our condition. That is what Eve did! When God said to Eve, ah, let me go even further back. When God said to Adam, what is this you have done? Did you eat from the tree of the knowledge of good and evil, which I told you you should not eat? Adam said, the woman that you gave me, it's her fault. Ultimately, God, it's your fault. How wretched. Sin had already taken hold of Adam's heart. God turns his attention to Eve. What is this you have done? It's not my fault, Lord. The devil made me do it. It's the serpent. He deceived me. Don't blame me. Blame him. It's not worth even going down this path, but I have wondered at times. I wonder if things would have been different had Adam said, Lord, it's me. It's my fault. I'm the one who did this. Blame me and me alone. Have mercy on me, Lord. If Eve would have said, I'm the one who did it. It's not, it's not the voice of the serpent. I shouldn't have listened to that serpent. I should have listened to you. I don't know. I don't know how anything would have been different, but maybe it would have. Yet that's not what man does. He shifts the blame away from me and onto somebody else. It's someone else's fault. It's what somebody told me. It's the woman you put here with me. It's actually your fault, Lord. I wouldn't be this way if you hadn't made me like this. Blaming everyone else but ourselves. And that's the lie of the evil one. And, and the evil one has perpetuated that lie ever since, hasn't he? He's perpetuated that lie that it's everyone else's fault but mine. It's my parents' fault for how I was raised. It's my circumstances' fault. It's because I have bad luck. That's the only reason why I'm in the situation I'm in. It's luck. It's just a crummy streak of bad luck. No, there's no such thing as that. There's no such thing as luck. If you're a Christian and you use that word luck, you need to stop using it. I'm lucky. No, no, that's pagan. Totally, totally, utterly pagan view of the world. That luck is, is anything. Luck is nothing. There is no such thing as that. You use providence, right? not luck. And take responsibility for ourselves. To these people, the truth sounds like a lie because they're so accustomed to lies. But even though that's the case, Jesus says to them in verse 46, in 47, which one of you convicts me of sin? See, they couldn't, even though... To them, the truth sounds like a lie. They could not convict him of sin, not according to the Bible. He says, if I speak the truth, why don't you believe me? He who is of God hears the words of God. For this reason, you do not hear them because you are not of God. Here the Lord, in essence, pounds the gavel. He issues the ultimate reason for man's unbelief. Here it is. 
The reason that they do not hear is because they are not of God. Later in John 18, 37, at his trial, Jesus tells Pontius Pilate, In fact, the reason I was born and came into the world is to testify to the truth. Everyone on the side of truth listens to me. And Pilate says to him, What is truth? And he walks away. With that reply, Pilate then necessarily condemns himself and exposes himself as a child of the devil. Because Jesus says, if you listen to the truth, you listen to me. So he's not of the truth. Pilate condemns himself with that statement. So then, in conclusion, the question may be asked, why do we preach the gospel to unbelievers? Unbelievers are lost in darkness. They don't believe the truth of the children of the devil. Why? Because we know not who it is that God has chosen to translate out of the kingdom of darkness and into the kingdom of light. We do not know whom the Holy Spirit may awaken and draw out of Satan's family and to bring into God's family. And so... We preach the gospel to all. We make the call to everyone and we leave the rest in God's hands, trusting that his word never returns void, but always accomplishes the very purpose for which he sends it. It always accomplishes it. So here's the question for you. Here's the question for me. Do you hear his voice? Do you, do you believe in him? I'm not asking if you go to church. I'm not asking if you read the Bible. I'm not asking if you're in a Bible study. I'm not asking if you went and held a sign outside saying that abortion is bad. I'm not asking those things. I'm asking, do you believe in him? Do you believe in him? Do you hear his voice? If you don't, I've already told you the reason why you don't. If you don't, it's because you're lost. It's because you actually hate God and the things of God. Yet, even for all of that, even for all of our hatred, even while we were enemies of God, God sent his son into the world to save sinners. Even sinners as lost as I was. Even sinners as lost as you were. Even the worst from the uttermost to the guttermost. The Lord calls his own to himself. He goes and finds his lost sheep. Yet for all of that, Christ still calls you to come to him. While we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. Come to him today and find mercy in the Lord Jesus Christ. That's what you have to do. That's what you have to do. And if you've done that already... Let us give him thanks for drawing us out of the kingdom of darkness and translating us into the kingdom of his wonderful son. In Jesus' name, amen. Let us pray. Let us pray. Oh Lord, we were once lost in darkness, hard-hearted in our unbelief. And you've called us out of that to yourself. Lord, have mercy on those who we love, who may be lost, who might, maybe we've shared the good news of Christ with them many times and they've rejected it and rejected it. Let us not give up, but continue to shine the light of the gospel to them, knowing that your word always accomplishes its purpose and it never returns void. Lord, draw your people to yourself. Turn them from darkness to light. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. We're going to sing hymn number 699. Tis so sweet to trust. In Jesus, let's trust in him. Who else will we go to? There's no one else that has the words of life. Only Christ alone. That's why it's so sweet to trust in him. Let's stand and sing together.
is so sweet to trust in Jesus, just to take him at his word, just to rest upon his promise, just to know, thus saith the Lord, Jesus, Jesus, how I trust him, how I've proved him o'er and o'er, Jesus, Jesus, precious Jesus, oh, for grace to trust him more. Oh, how sweet to trust in Jesus, just to trust his cleansing blood, just in simple faith to plunge me neath the healing, cleansing flood. Jesus, Jesus, how I trust him, how I've proved him o'er and o'er. Jesus, Jesus, precious Jesus, oh, for grace to trust him more. Yes, it is sweet to trust in Jesus, just from sin and self to cease. Just from Jesus simply taking life and rest and joy and peace. Jesus, Jesus, how I trust him, how I've proved him more and more. Jesus, Jesus, precious Jesus, oh, for grace to trust him more. I'm so glad I learned to trust Thee, precious Jesus, Savior, friend. And I know that Thou art with me, wilt be with me to the end. Jesus, Jesus, how I trust Him, how I've proved Him more and more. Jesus, Jesus, precious Jesus, oh, for grace to trust Him more. And now to Him who is able to keep you from stumbling and to make you stand in the presence of His glory, blameless and with great joy, to the only God, our Savior, through Jesus Christ, our Lord, be glory, majesty, dominion, and authority before all time and now and forevermore. And all of God's people said, Amen. Amen. May God be with you all.